Hello, welcome. Hey, 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 what's up? Amir, how are you? Doing well. It's a fun Sunday evening here. How are you doing? Mine are... I'm okay, man. How are you? Yeah, great, indeed. Fine evening. Yeah, it's it's very warm here also. I assume it's getting pretty hot there too. Uh, yeah, actually, <laughs> evenings are fine these days, but uh, the days are getting hotter. You, could, you know, we're getting closer to summer. We're already in the 1st of May, which is uh, almost summer, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, hi, everyone, and welcome to Beam Weekly Space. And uh, we have a lot of interesting events to discuss today. And of course, uh, some uh, updates about Beam upcoming release. Um, we're going to announce as a kind of unofficial announcement, tomorrow announcement, but today we're going to announce the height of the hard fork, which is uh, going to happen in the beginning of June, just as a scoop to our listeners. But um, do we know? Do we know the exact block height, or will we find out soon? Uh, so we know, and uh, I think uh, we will wait for a few more minutes. Maybe more people will join. But let's start with the interesting events of this week, which was kind of yeah. yeah it was a uh, shit show all around. <laughs> Is it ever not a shit show? Oh, man, I don't know. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, uh, I think this year, 2022, is going to be known as the year of the hackers because already, I think, it uh, already kind of overshadowing the entire last year in terms of the money stolen by various hackers from various contracts and uh, DeFi applications. Um, it's right now, just like up to this day, May 1st, $1.57 billion was stolen from DeFi apps, Ooh. which is more than one, $1.55 billion stolen in entire last year, 2021. So I think it's uh, absolutely you know, like number. Uh, and it shows two things. First of all, like there is more activity in DeFi this year, definitely. But it also shows that uh, a lot of contracts are still very, very vulnerable. And uh, like, like only uh, last month, like April, Two of the largest attacks happened in April. One was uh, the Beanstalk exploit that we have talked about last week. It was like 122 yeah. million. And then only, I think, a couple of days ago, there was another hack of about 80 million from Rari. Um, I think it's absolutely crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like... A... It it shows just how much money is is involved in DeFi and locked in these places and and not locked for a for a big part of it. Uh, but it seems like a, a lot of I, I mean back in two thousand and eighteen, so much of the attention was on like centralized solutions, like centralized exchanges and these kind of things, and and trying to like hackers focusing their attention on there. And and like the last year and and a bit, we've seen so much more focus on like DeFi protocols as they've started to grow and more eyes on them, and of course with more eyes coming like exploits and this kind of thing. But the numbers are crazy. It's absolutely unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. So I I have my my personal take on it, and uh, of course I will not um, miss this opportunity for a little Ethereum bashing. Uh, but I, I, like honestly, it's not. It's not like I, I'm not a hater, right? I'm not. I don't have anything about uh, like these all of these new technologies. But I feel that the problem with popularity of EVM and you know solidity based contracts 
uh, is kind of this weak spot of this entire um, concept because, in my opinion, solidity uh, is very uh, a kind of error prone. I would say, like it's it's not the problem with the EVM or the language itself, but it makes it kind of difficult to close all of these gaps. For example, um, let's talk about this Rarik use exploit. Um, first of all, Rarik, uh, it's not the first time they were kind of hacked, but this time it's a um, um, problem called reentrancy, uh, reentrancy exploit. And the way it works, it's like when you read about it, uh, it's like re really, you know, simple and you will say like what like how how could this happen like after all of the audits and all of the you know tests that people uh, run on it but it works like this you basically deposit some money into the contract and then you withdraw this money right but when you withdraw you provide an address of another contract and when the withdraw function tries to run and execute this call on this other contract, before the original balance is updated, the contract calls this function again. So basically, you call withdraw, and the withdraw calls the contract, and the contract calls withdraw again, and the original never updated. So let's say you deposit one Ethereum, and then you want to like, take it out. So we check the balance. Yes, we have one Ethereum. Let's give it to the other contract. And then the other contract calls it again. So we check the balance again. Oh, it wasn't updated yet. So yeah, we still have another one Ethereum. So we just do this kind of rinse and repeat operation until all of the money from the contract is gone. And it's basically the operations, right? Uh, when you check the balance before uh, you execute the function, but you don't update it yet because you know, the update, the, the withdrawal didn't happen yet. So you, you want to make sure the withdrawal actually succeed, is successful. And this is what allows for these kinds of attacks. And um, there is a very good explanation that I found uh, on the Hacker Noon website, and I will uh, post it in our Twitter right now in the replies to our uh, tweet about this space. Uh, like, very clear and uh, uh, explanation. And it's a well-known attack. Uh, but it is still, as you can see, uh, can be used very effectively, and uh, they drained eighty million dollars like that. It's crazy. Like, uh, and this is one of the more common like exploits that keeps popping up, right? Yeah, absolutely. You said that uh, you, you noticed that exploits mostly happen on weekends. Yeah, that, like uh, I mean, I I've never looked at like the hard data on when the exploits <laughs> happen, but it always seems like they're at really strange hours, like in the middle of the night or on weekends, and when when like the the people looking after the protocols are at home and and also the the hackers are off of work, so can tinker around and and check out what's going on. <laughs> So what, what's, what's our theory here? That the hackers actually work nine to five and then uh, on weekends they hack for billions yeah, of dollars. Yeah, <laughs> and they have very, very confused accountants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's a possibility. Yeah, I, th I think like not only in crypto, but in general, like many, many hackers like have a really bad stigma and or not even bad, but like, they're almost portrayed as like some anarchistic kind of like the V for Vendetta guy. I forget his name. Uh, but uh, like if I had to guess, knowing nothing about hackers or like coding or technology in general, if I had to guess, I think a lot of them would be like very normal individuals that are interested in like computers and, and how things are around. And then all of a sudden... Uh, something's found and and then exploits happen. Of course, like of course, there's some that are that are like solely out to to make money and and drain liquidity pools and this kind of. But I assume a lot of it is is also more like a stumbling upon it without meaning to kind of thing. That's exactly the thing. Like, uh, I think that today most of the industry relies on code for kind of prevention of these hacks. 
the reality is that, um, and, and I'm talking from experience like here, that the audits can discover um, like problems with conceptual implementation. But if you're not doing Zorro testing, including simulations, including automated testing, running all kinds of different scenarios, uh, it's very difficult to find these problems. Um, and when you are testing a, a, a contract, you usually test the, in the formal API. But obviously, in, in case of reentrance attacks, uh, part of this API is being abused by other contracts, which can do other things that you don't anticipate when you are testing your implementation because you you are kind of biased towards how it's supposed to work. Uh, and once it happens, uh, there is very little you can do. Uh, there was another hack, by the way, uh, also, I think, uh, today or yesterday of Saddle protocol. Yeah, this, it was, I think it was almost at the same time as the Rari, Rari one. Mm -hmm. and, and there was, I think, 10 million that was hacked. And then a white hack, a white hat from... Or oh, I forget the name of the firm, but they managed to save like uh, three million or something that was still kind of at large. Another interesting uh, hack almost happened today, uh, but eventually didn't. Was of the Rainbow Bridge, and uh, oh, yeah. that yeah, that was that was the one uh, that went for the good guys because yeah. the hack was not <laughs> successful. <laughs> Uh, even though I feel there were like they kind of dodged the bullet here because they, what, what one interesting thing about this specific um, hack is that it kind of relied on the MEV attack back like the, the MEV uh, front ran the hack transaction. Yeah. So the, the, the original hacker lost money and the attack didn't really uh, succeed. Uh, but I think very interesting and the uh, case, and there is a long thread which I'm now posting in Twitter that describes exactly what happened here. I think it's a must read for everyone who is like technical and interested in the space, because I think that uh, the sequence of events was was very interesting. Like uh, when the hacker transaction is actually being outrun by the MEV, I think it's uh, it's special. Yeah, I mean, like, usually MEV is kind of like a, an evil that's, like, taking money from the poor user that set his slippage on Uniswap to 50% or whatever and stuff like this. But it's it's nice to see, like, solutions or, or places where they can kind of profit and also be profitable in, like, a situation that is kind of net positive for the the protocols and this kind of thing. Absolutely. So in general, um, we kind of, like, I, I think it's it's relatively new, like uh, a phenomenon that we see that the popularity, the actual real, like, popularity of uh, some protocols and some projects is becoming a problem, like, big time for a lot of chains. Uh, Solana went down again, as you know. Yeah, uh, as we were talking earlier, it's it's almost becoming like scheduled maintenance. <laughs> yeah, but this time it was because there was a, a kind of bot attack that tried to mint some NFTs, right? Yeah. So, like they're trying to do uh, so many transactions that uh, uh, the validators went out of sync and were not able to produce a block for like seven hours. Um, so that's like kind of the, the, the problem with popularity, even though I think that the much bigger example we have to talk about is that airdrop from uh, Yuga Labs, who are yeah. the uh, organization or DAO or whatever behind the, uh, the apes. Yeah. The, and, and, and they uh, had some... NFT drop last night on Ethereum. Yeah, and it 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 went uh, poorly, I would say. Like, I think there was one hundred million dollars paid in fees for failed transactions. <laughs> yeah, this sounds about right. 
I mean, it's crazy. Uh, and uh, it, it went so far that they actually announced today that they are going uh, off Ethereum. They're going to either, I don't know, build their own chain or move to some layer two or whatever, because clearly uh, Ethereum cannot handle the, the amount of volume that they want. So obviously they could have designed their jobs much better, right? So it's not like uh, there was not a solution, but uh, if you do it uh, like this in this straightforward way, uh, because of the high demand and because once again of the design of Ethereum that makes you pay for failed transactions, which by the way, Beam does not do, um, but uh, it, it's it's crazy. Like one hundred million dollars, it's unbelievable. Such a such a huge amount of money. I mean, the miners. Oh the yeah, miners they, they would have had had, uh, had a failed day. They had a great day. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. The uh, the one the one thing I thought when they kind of like. When I, I didn't, I tried to stay awake to to watch like the what should unfold and and fell asleep about ten minutes before at four fifty in the morning, of course. Uh, <laughs> but the <laughs> the one thing I thought when they said like, oh, we need like Ethereum cannot handle it, we need our own chain, and I thought like it makes sense that it didn't go smoothly, like uh, coming out with a statement saying that you think you will make your own like blockchain is not something that you decide in the 12 hours after like an NFT mint clogs the network. So my, at least myself, like my, my first thought was like, okay, they could have designed the NFT drop in a far more like, and it would be far more like a, or far less wasteful for that are trying to mint and failing and this kind of stuff. But then there wouldn't be so much justification for ape chain or whatever it's going to be. Absolutely. I think that uh, it, it came back like several years ago, there was, uh, what was the name of that uh, first, uh, uh, this kind of project that also brought down the serial almost, I think, um, there's been a few. One was, or at least one NFT one was Crypto Kitties, which I think yeah, did, yeah, yeah, that like, one, yeah, Crypto did Kitties. similar. Yeah, this. I, I actually, I, I never paid much attention to to Crypto Kitties. I, I do actually. I, I lied. I <laughs> in some old Ethereum wallet, I have about two dollars worth of dust and two cats that I bought with the idea that I would, I would breed the cats and, and make lots of money. Unfortunately, that didn't happen, and, and they're sleeping in, in an old wallet. But yeah, I think that, <laughs> I think that CryptoKitties also had like a similar effect on Ethereum. I, I don't think they, we, like, uh, there was even uh, like an NFT concept back then. I think it was just like, not, not even the, like, the standard was there, I think, but I'm not sure, I'm not a, an Ethereum expert. Uh, but now we're with those, uh, Step in or whatever the name of these sneakers, right? Yeah, and I, I was talking to I, – I talked to you earlier about this today and, and also had a comment after that. And, and Step in, for those that don't know, it's like a, a walking app and you get in a shoe and then you can walk and you get money and blah, 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 blah. Very similar concept to like Axies Infinity and, and also Crypto Kitties. And what made me laugh is that, you, and, and they don't call it this, of course, they call it like minting a, a new sneaker, <laughs> but your shoes, your shoes can have babies, like a baby shoe. And I, yeah. and I found that very funny. And this is like a very similar concept to Crypto Kitties, which will probably end in a similar way. In my opinion, like mass saturation of all of these shoes having babies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can call it proof of walk. Yeah. yeah. Well, at least it gives you, you know, the opportunity to house every once in a while. Uh, yeah, if nothing I, else I, does. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like I bought, I bought some shoes. I, I've told you this, but I'll tell everyone else. I bought some shoes for my girlfriend so that she could get some coins because she's always fascinated about like getting coins without having to buy them and. Uh, stuff like this and then she constantly was asking me questions like how do I do this how do I walk how do I how do I get coins and so I ended up buying some for myself and 
and now every day I have to go out in the Dubai sunshine oh, no. and know. walk to <laughs> to earn some some money for dinner and that kind of thing. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, so um, so uh, a lot of cool stuff <laughs> is happening <laughs> in this world. Um, let's talk uh, a little bit about about Beam. Um, and then let's open the mic for questions. And uh, last time there were great questions, actually. Um, and uh, we only left, I think, like 15 or 20 minutes. So today we will start early because uh, if somebody wants to ask something, I think it's always, always interesting. And uh, if not, we will just continue yapping. So what about BIM? Um, as you know, we're getting ready for our uh, 7.0 release, which is going to be a hard fork. Uh, the release is going to happen in the beginning of May, like I think we're currently in the final stages of testing. I think now there are like uh, some holidays um, in, in several countries, but uh, uh, I think this week, later this week, we will release the test net and then next week probably the main net because we're really near the end. And the actual fork will uh, happen in the beginning of June at uh, the block height of 1 million, 790,000, so 179 and four zeros. Uh, and there will be obviously official announcement tomorrow in the newsletter. And But for those who are here, it's like an early early scoop uh, on this important height. So for me and for us in Beam, like it's a very, very important release. Uh, I can't really wait. Like it's been a long time since our last major update. And uh, in this version, we kind of tie in together all of the infrastructure components that are going to be essential moving forward to develop our ecosystem. So what are, first of all, uh, IPFS integration? So IPFS integration started with our NFT uh, kind of gallery that we wanted to expand to full-fledged NFT project. And uh, we found a lot of very interesting applications uh, to this integration with the IPFS, including uh, Source, uh, which is the new project being incubated by BMX DAO. Um, so this is like just one of the, I think, great uses of this IPFS integration. The other major feature that we're rolling out uh, is the uh, decentralized application store, which allows you to distribute dApps built for Beam in a completely decentralized way. We talked about it a lot last week how there is a major problem in the ecosystem today that most of the front ends or you like in general your access to the blockchain is actually run by centralized services um, and i don't want to talk about it again but we see that infura is a very key player and it's centralized and when it goes down metamask users lose their access and a lot of other projects rely on it and all of the front ends for the DeFi apps are actually run on centralized servers so in Beam, we want to provide this alternative or like a better way so that you can distribute your application in a completely decentralized way, fully confidential through IPFS and smart contract that allows you to publish your apps. And they're running from inside your wallet completely locally or not relying on any centralized components. I think it's an amazing feature. It was much more kind of complicated thought. Um, a lot of effort went into that. Uh, but it, uh, it's there and it's going to be released soon. Um, another very important update is the high-frequency transactions. And uh, speaking of uh, scalability issues, so the high-frequency transactions is kind of layer two for Beam in a way, in, in that it allows uh, applications to use the mempool as a kind of more sophisticated data structure, not just a list of transactions waiting to be mined. And it allows to predict and in some cases um, specify the exact ordering of transactions even before the block is mined. So we can use that for uh, our DeFi applications to have kind of quicker uh, response times there. We're still not sure exactly how much uh, speed it will bring in terms of transactions per second because it depends on a specific application and implementation, but it will definitely be more than waiting for a block to be mined just to be able to respond to some event. So these are the kind of key um, key things that we're uh, releasing. Of course, there are also a lot of improvements 
in the contracts themselves, in the uh, upgradable uh, infrastructure, we have improved a lot there. So not to mention all of the uh, features and the uh, UI improvements that went into our, into our wallets. Um, we have learned a lot from this last period when we have started deploying first contracts. Uh, we have deployed the DAO core uh, application and we will also follow it by the voting platform immediately after the 7.0 release. The DeFi applications, Stablecoin and DEX will also follow uh, using the uh, availability of the decentralized app store. So there is a lot, a lot of things to pour in the upcoming couple of months. Um, yeah, and we're, we're almost there, almost there. Wicked. That all sounds, <laughs> I mean, I, this all sounds very amazing. And, and I have, I have many questions also, much of, much of them I already know the answers to. So <laughs> I want to, I want to open up the mic for anyone that has any questions, especially regarding the upcoming hard fork, but also can be more general. Please wave or, oh, we have a request. Ballistic, terrible mirrors, nice. Absolutely. Here we go. Hey, everyone. Uh, yeah, I had a question about the IPFS integration. Um, so regarding incentives, I, I was... So a lot of people know that IPF, IPFS uh, can optionally use Filecoin to incentivize and you know properly pay for things like storage and you know the length of storage for example um so what is the thought around that with beam um will we be able to pay for storage for x amount of months or years with beam great question um, so, yes, indeed, there are uh, several projects out there. I file for them, I think, are with, right, is the another one. And uh, they are uh, creating this decentralized storage that is uh, monetized and governed by uh, tokens. And when we have started our own implementation, that was the kind of one of the possibilities that we investigated is actually integrating with one of these projects and uh, not using IPFS directly. But uh, eventually we chose IPFS because of several things. First of all, it was kind of a little bit simpler for us uh, not having deal both with the technical side of the integration and with this kind of another ecosystem with its own token. And right now what is going to happen is that um, there will be no kind of specific tokenomics for our IPFS integration. It will be used for um, initially for the uh, obviously the NFT application and for the DAP store. So it's kind of going to be used our own internal uh, applications. So let's say, for example, in case of the DAP store, when you uh, when you are downloading from uh, um, from somewhere and then you pin it, like you use it locally, so you pin it locally and somebody can download it from you. But having said that, of course, we will be uh, providing at least at first our own caching services, right? So let's say, for example, you minted, like you, you upload an NFT locally and uh, you need to distribute it, right? You need to be make it available for everyone else. And this is going to be at least at first provided by our uh, segment, not centralized, but run by beam caching services right so we will we will take care of that um uh, in the future we might uh, both like first of all it's, it's a kind of a um, doesn't necessarily have to be like ipfs all the time this is like the first implementation in the future we might integrate with other projects but at least initially it's going to be a closed network so we're not going to connect in the first version to the global ipfs we will create our own kind of beam ipfs cluster and yes, we will have to provide caching services in order to make uh, the availability uh, known and you know, all of this uh, information available to everyone. Yeah, thank you for that explanation. I, I think, you know, if I had a if I had a critique of that, I it would just be around um, wanting a little bit more transparency in terms of 
the economics of it. You know, I, one of the benefits of crypto is is the ability to have more transparent business models. Um, I think it would be really nice to have a, a stronger understanding of if we're going to use Beam's IPFS implementation or network, you know, how long are these, how long is this data guaranteed to be up for? How much is it costing you guys to run these nodes? You know, it would be, it would be, it would be great if we could have some kind of like Beam invoicing where, you know, proof of payment and then you're guaranteed for this amount of time, that kind of thing. Great point. I don't have a good answer for that other than you're co absolutely correct and uh, we need to take care of that and we will think about it. But great critique. Do we have any more questions? If we do not, for now, at least, I have a question about one of the things that was brought up uh, for the next release. Let me find it. I wrote it down somewhere. Uh, so we mentioned the high frequency transactions and also like earlier we mentioned about MEV or MEV, which is for those that are less familiar, it's minor extractable value. Uh, and this, I don't have a very good like definition of, but I will do my best anyway. It's where there's like opportunities, uh, maybe it's arbitrage on the blockchain and people, uh, or sorry, miners have the chance to order the transactions on a block to make more money than they would if they were doing it solely sort of uh, fee-based. Uh, and so it's, so maybe there's like a, a chance for a transaction to go through that's an arbitrage of two different liquidity pools. There was an interesting one a while back also related to the ape NFTs where someone took all of the apes out of one of the kind of tokenized pools and claimed the ape airdrop and sold it and then sold them back to the liquidity pool, this kind of stuff. And so my question is, how will the high frequency transactions uh, relate to, if at all, MEV? And will this kind of be, yeah, that's the question. How will, MEV work on Beam, and does the high frequency transactions relate to this in any way? Um, it's also an amazing question, and um, not a simple one to answer because so obviously uh, high frequency transactions will not prevent like all kinds of uh, minor acceptable value attacks or like uh, not attacks but like opportunities. Uh, but they will prevent some. Um, let me try to kind of explain it um, as simple as possible. Uh, basically, the high frequency transactions treat the mempool as a tree instead of a list, right? So let's say you are a miner and you see in front of you a list of transactions that are going to be mined. And as a miner, you have this unique opportunity that other uh, users of the network do not have of uh, basically like throwing out specific transactions you don't like and replacing them with your own transactions if you think they can benefit from them or putting your transactions before or after or both uh, this specific transaction that you have detected uh, as an opportunity for an arbitrage. So when you uh, use high frequency transactions and you specify the exact ordering that you would like to see, like let's say, you are looking at the mempool at this point and you say, okay, I want my transaction to be right after this one that I currently see. And there is a condition that says that your transaction is only going to go through in this order. Like if the order changes, you basically throw out the entire branch. And the miner obviously has several branches to select from and the miner, like assuming he's a, a honest miner, will select the one that has the most because that's his uh, targets to profits from, from the fees in those transactions. 
However, the miner will not be able to change the order or to put his transactions, like if, at least not before, for sure, uh, the transaction that you have sent, uh, because otherwise your transaction will not go through since that's the condition that you initially have put on the transaction that you have sent to the, to the network. So I think that some of the attacks will like, will not be as simple as they are uh, in, in other blockchains that use like more simple mempool model. But I don't think it will prevent like all attacks completely because after all, as a miner, we have quite a lot of influence. Like for example, you can throw the entire branch, you can replace it with your branch and then try to push it uh, you know, as a block uh, that you're mining. So yeah, um, I think that's that's kind of the situation. Wicked, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think this is like, uh, I find the minor extractable value one of the more like fascinating aspects of, of what's going on. Uh, and I expect the same in, in Beam as well. And, and like my hunch is that there will be some very interesting cases that come up especially with like the the launch of the decks and the stable coin and this kind of thing exciting times my my favorite uh, uh, thing in DeFi is the flash loans I think it's an absolutely amazing thing it's like something that doesn't exist anywhere I think outside of DeFi and uh, we, we last week we talked about the uh, DAO attack uh, it was on Bitstock, I think uh, where the flash loan was used uh, in in the governance process. And it yep. is actually a problem uh, that needs to be designed into the protocol. So the protocol in specific cases should like explicitly uh, prohibit uh, using flash loans because, um, like, for example, you cannot, let's say, uh, take and repay the loan in the same block. You need to wait for at least one block and things like that. And it needs to be designed into the protocol. Otherwise, it can cause problems. Um, even more interestingly, uh, and it's like a li little known fact, but uh, because of this uh, Mimble Wimble uh, layer of the protocol, uh, you know, it's um, basically just needs to sum to zero, right? All of the things that you are spending and, and getting. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it makes it even, even more kind of um, important to protect it against these kind of attacks because when you loan, like when you take the flash loan, this money that you're taking can not even exist like in reality because you know you do it in the same transaction uh as long as it's zero you can borrow a gazillion beam and then pay it back nobody needs to know because uh that that's how it works like in new google so you, you you theoretically can borrow money that doesn't even exist so yeah we, we're taking these precautions and it's like it makes it important to uh protect against flash loans where there is uh, a possibility of abusing them. Absolutely. And and in, actually, I, I didn't think about this for like the, the Mimble Wimble side of it, that as long as it zeroes out, it's okay. So you can, you can borrow kind of as much as you want. Yeah. Uh, this um, uh, kind of strange magic, magical things, some good, some bad, some that we, we need to be careful. Absolutely. I have like a, a follow up question with regards to flash loans. Like, uh, as I see flash loans anyway, they're like a huge benefit to ecosystems in that they kind of democratize, for lack of a better word, or sort of open up like capital to participants that don't necessarily have the capital uh yeah but if you if you kind of like block out flash loans just flash loans at least then does it not become a matter of like capital and and the attack vector is still there you just have to have uh kind of enough of the asset required or this kind of thing rather than being able to borrow it and the reason i ask is because Bean, Bean Finance, not to be confused with Bean Privacy, Bean Finance, the one that was exploited uh, with a flash loan via a governance attack. A similar thing happened maybe 
a few weeks or a couple of months. Time is time is elusive and hard to keep track of. But there was a similar a similar attack, uh, a governance attack, and the kind of did it simply bought the underlying asset, and not many people were paying attention. Uh, and he bought enough that he could kind of push through a proposal and and vote vote on it and then ended up draining like the liquor that was that was available it was like i think they minted infinite kind of coins and and oh, sold man. them and and took the liquidity that was there which like you could have protections in place for flash loans and that would still like this instance would still be possible uh yeah i i don't think like i think flash loans are are a good thing uh when used correctly um but it is very strong uh kind of uh tool or like mechanism uh needs to be used very carefully just like leverage trading right so leverage trading is a good thing right you can uh, maximize your profits when you're right but when you are wrong you're going wrong much quicker than you would otherwise and uh uh, you are basically in debt, like in debt, right? So it's, you you spend money you don't have. So the same goes for flash loans. Um, once again, like in in Beam, you don't pay uh, fees for failed transactions. The transaction will not go through if the conditions for it are not right. So you have less of a risk of let's say just uh, like in, in Beam, you would never pay millions of dollars just to miners because of failed transactions. That, that's not going to happen, which is very good, in my opinion, much better design. Uh, but anyway, when you are doing any kind of, like uh, for a trade or any opportunity, it's, it's always risky and uh, needs to be taken with care. And uh, obviously in anything re that's related to governance, I don't think flash loans should, uh, should work there because you know governance is not about getting rich opportunities. Governance is about governance long-term you know thoughtful uh but yeah um i agree it happens happens a lot um people um like one of the problems that i see now in this space is that there is an original protocol that was audited that like it's running for a long time and people who actually implemented it know what they're doing and then there are a lot of forks clones and basically people who take the code modify it a little bit and run their own kind of similar versions. And uh, uh, when there is a bug discovered in the original protocol, it's fixed. And then, you know, people get to know what the problem was. And then they're trying to run quickly and exploit all of the forks before they are uh, able to upgrade. Uh, that also, I think, happens a lot. Yeah, this this thing really like throw out. And I guess it's it's far easier for like the not far easier but far more likely for the people that write the code for the protocol to understand what's going on than and and be informed than it is the people that are forking the protocol or the blockchain or this kind of stuff <clears throat> in some cases when uh when you're running a protocol in ethereum like some kinds of a attack they're prohibit prohibitively uh, expensive because of the high fees but then when you take the same code and you run it on a much cheaper chain if it's polygon or bsc uh, then suddenly these attacks can be possible because they're cheaper and uh, you know there is a difference between kind of different blockchains and how they behave uh, even with regard to exactly the same um, you know contract kind of something that needs to be tested yeah, a good point. Uh, do we have any more questions from the crowd? Please wave or request to speak. No, I think it's going to be a short evening. May well be. Yeah, definitely. Cool. So I have, have one, no questions. I have one last <laughs> Yeah, I have one. Ahead. I have. I'm the question guy. I have one last question, uh, and and this is more like uh, about long term stuff for Bain. What do you see as the most like exciting use case for DeFi specifically on top of Bain? 
So, um, Beam currently is this kind of uh, an island, and we joked about it a lot, like with, with Amir and stuff. Like, we, we have our own kind of this nice island, and um, it's nice, but it's an island. And I think once we roll out the bridges, uh, and it means that you can bring liquidity to Beam and kind of trade it confidentially, I think this is going to be um, the most exciting kind of opportunity to um, change this pervade of, I don't know what to call it, uh, the situation where you can actually see and track all wallets and see what everyone is doing uh, and the amount of tools that are being developed today to use this information, to get more profitable trades. Um, I think once people realize that you can do it better, I think that's that's the most exciting thing for the BMD fight specifically. Absolutely. I think not just in terms of DeFi, when you think about privacy or, or of its own, it's also kind of a, it's almost like a tool. Like people, I imagine people that once we have the bridges, not necessarily decentralized protocol and decentralized project, but also centralized project will hopefully, with a lot of work, will kind of use Beam Tech powered by Beam, putting Beam in the background with, the, with regard to the bridges that Romano mentioned. I imagine like a wallet like whatever wallet, centralized one, offering to its users, yeah, just take your Ethereum, make them private, without even mentioning Beam. They will run a centralized bridge, they will be compliant because they know the user, the user did KYC, they know what they're doing, and yet the user will be fully private with a click of a button. So it's not exactly DeFi, it's not a question, but just to double down on the bridges that Romano mentioned, and not just in liquidity to Beam, it's also the approach of powered by Beam in the background on even centralized services. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, Amir sounded like he's stepping in the future yeah. right now. It, it's a long story, but I forgot my kids back at the kindergarten. So now that he fell asleep. Oh, okay, that's a, that's a problem. <laughs> Thank God it's a... She evening here, and it's a walking distance. <laughs> okay. Yeah, when you have 11 kids, it's just it's easy to forget. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. And um, it was great, as usual. See you next week. And uh, tomorrow is uh, the official update about 7.0. A lot to wait for. I'm going to be excited. And... Thank you very much for being here. Absolutely. And and one thing that I usually mentioned earlier, if you haven't, we have like, uh, if you haven't checked that out already, we have a forum post out, which is quite important, I would say. Uh, and it's talking about the reduction in the fees of confidential assets. So there's quite a bit of conversation happening in there now. So if you haven't signed up, I'm shilling the forum. If you haven't signed up, head on over and, and sign up and and let us know what you think about the fees for the confidential assets running on top of the BIM. Post, post the link in Twitter. Yeah, absolutely. Also, correct me if I'm wrong, Romanov, but this needs to be set by the time 7.0 hit mainnet. Yes. So roughly about, let's say, one. but one week to testnet and then one week to mainnet, right? Roughly. Less, probably, yeah. Less. So I, I would say let's close it in about the and then we will be on the, on the good side. Yeah. Also important to note, because it needs to go to 7.0, which afterwards we'll have the voting up, this is the last probably vote that we'll do. Thus, you yeah. need higher participation. So do go to the forum, express your opinion, because at the end, it's going to be an off-chain pool. Okay. We're good. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Gus. Thank you, Amir. And, and see you, you all next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.